Lesson this morning. We are going to finish up this morning on this part of chapter one. We've been studying on the foundation of the believer's life, <clears throat> Colossians chapter one, verses one through 11. And so we're going to finish up with the final verses of that portion. And we'll, uh, we'll get into that in just a moment, but I'm going to go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer at this time. Gracious Holy Father, we come before you, Lord, with thankful hearts that um, in light of all the challenges we face today, we've had um, a lot to deal with, but we've also had the opportunity now to come into your house and still be a part of this um, moment in time to, to where we can come together and fellowship um, and be in this place and serve and worship you. And we know you know the difficulties, but um, Lord, we know that um, you love when your people come together for the purposes of, of being in your presence and studying your word and, and bringing you praise. And so we make effort to do that this morning and pray that you'll be our guide. We ask that, Lord, as you look over our lives and you see our shortcomings, we pray you'll forgive us and that you'll just bring us close to you and help us, Lord, to be warmed by your spirit. We pray that your spirit will be guide to us today, that you will help us to um, grasp and understand the lesson that it might um, flourish in our lives and bloom and that, Lord, we might reflect back on these things and uh, continue to try to make the necessary changes in, in the Spirit, by the Spirit, and through your Word. Father, I pray that your power will be felt in each life, that you're, it'll, it'll accompany your Word as it goes out. I pray for teaching grace this morning. I pray, Father, that you would bless the Word and in me, and Lord, and I pray that your Spirit will have full course in this lesson. I pray for the requests that I've lifted up here this morning for young Kyla and, and, and the injuries she endured and the, and the challenges that the parents will need um, or will be facing and the strength that they'll need as they help her um, and, and her recovery. And Father, I pray that the recovery will be good and well and that she will uh, recover faster. And Lord, I just pray that you'll bless in that. I pray that you'll be with our pastor and Jesse, Lord, and on all of our sick uh, members. Um, that you might just help them to get well and, and restore their health so they can be back in your house with us. Father, and I, I pray that you'll just um, bless now as we go into your word, uh, bless it as it goes out and to, um, as it's streamed online, Lord, and I pray it'll continue to return unto you uh, with its accomplished work. And Father, I, I give you the praise. I ask for your forgiveness and these things I, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the foundation of the believer's life I will go ahead and get us down where we're starting this morning. And it is down a little ways, but it is right here. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at this morning is the great requests of prayer. Um, prayer becomes the fundamental uh, aspect to a successful service, a, fu a fundamental aspect to successful service. And you see it employed a lot in the scriptures. It's one of those things that um, that I think we all might admit to ourselves we could do a better job at praying more. I, at least that's the way I feel. Um, and I, I, I got to be more mindful of it. I think it's the, the gateway to success in everything we do. And, and I've noticed that when we do pray um, for the things that we, we pray about, like whether it be for someone or we pray about uh, lessons or messages, that we see greater success as a result of that. Um, I, I, I started off with this picture because it was the one that I found. <laughs> Actually, I kind of cropped it a little bit. If you saw, if you were to see the, uh, the actual whole picture, cause it wouldn't fit really in my PowerPoint if I didn't crop it, but it kind of looked like our church building. <laughs> the pews looked like our pews, except for they have a, they have a different carpet. But anyways, I just kind of thought to myself, Hey, that looks like, uh, that looks like our place. But anyways. I, I don't know where I was going with that. I guess I was just having myself, I'm just talking to myself up here, just having me a good old time. <laughs> so anyway, these verses will be in these verses or these verses we'll be looking at this morning are actually part of a prayer in which Paul prayed that the love which he mentioned and had been told, had, had been told they had in the spirit in verse eight would be demonstrated in a life that manifest a walk worthy of God. So he was going to pray when he, he he was told and it was revealed to him that they had, that these people had a love in the spirit. He wanted to pray so that that love would be demonstrated in life and it would manifest itself in a way in each individual and ultimately in the church as a whole, a walk worthy of the Lord. So that's maturation. They wanted to, he, he was praying for their spiritual maturity. 
so that this love would manifest itself and grow and, and produce these things in, in their life. And these things were going to be beneficial. And, and quite frankly, I mean, how can you not love a person that is, is allowing that to happen in their life? This kind of conduct is pleasing to everyone as, is, as it is honorable in every respect and is productive with regard to every Christian virtue and endeavor. It is productive and it, it is something that, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of watching people here do the things that they do and, 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 and do it for the right spirit, I believe, and, um, and see it, it, them prosper as a result. I've seen it in the history of our church. You know, some of the people that are here today weren't here before, and a lot of the people that were here are not here now. And there's been oh, many people I've met and served with over the years. But this kind of conduct, when the love of the Spirit is demonstrated in life, it produces a walk worthy. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing and an honorable thing to behold. And it really um, it, it pro- is productive in regard to our Christian virtues. It makes them better. How could it not? I mean, really? So here's the verses we're going to be looking at this morning. And I, I underlined all the stuff I wanted to touch on, so I kind of un- almost underlined the whole thing. But here's what it says. It says, for this cause, we also, and we're talking about the love that they had in the spirit and the love that, 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 that um, needed to grow, you know. Matter of fact, verse 8, let me, before I read this, verse 8 said, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. And then he says, for this cause, as a result of, Hearing that or knowing that, we also, since the day we heard it, do do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, and um, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. So there's a lot right there that is a part of this prayer. You know, we cease not to pray for you for all these things. And if you look at the things that he was praying for, you want to know what to pray for. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good thing to pray for right here. <laughs> if you want to pray for something, pray for these things for yourself, but pray for them for, for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for me to have them. I would love that. <laughs> Absolutely. That if you prayed for me to grow in spiritual wisdom and, and understanding and, 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 you know, all the things that's mentioned there. So that's where we're going to really start. Unceasing prayer. Verse 9, he says, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire. Now, and here's one of the things. I didn't touch on this, but I just saw it and I thought to myself, I should touch on it. The word desire right there. The thing about this kind of prayer that, that Paul is talking about is it's, the word is efficacious, um, effectual, fervent. You, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He's expressing and, and to desire that you might be filled. So he, he had this desire. He was he is not ceasing because he had this desire for them. So there's this, there's this element of, he's praying with the mind and the heart to bring about a certain effect. And that was the way that his prayer was structured. He wanted to see this effect brought about in their lives. And that's true intercessory prayer. You're, you're praying. Like if we're going to pray for some, some of these requests, like I know that uh, one of our fellow members was saying her family wasn't going to make it today because they're sick. If we want to pray for them to get well, we should be praying with the heart, with the desire to see them get well. And that's how we should be lifting it up before God. But unceasing prayer. In the opening part of this verse, Paul mentioned that he prayed unceasingly for the Colossian saints since the day he since the day we heard it. So he's been praying unceasingly. The word it refers back to verse four. And verse four said, since we heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have of all the saints. So really... It refers back to verse four, what he had heard about their faith in Christ, their love for the saints, and ultimately their hope in heaven, um, the three pillars of the Christian life. So he he was admiring the fact that they had faith, hope, and love. And so since they heard it, that's 
what he was praying that this would flourish or grow. Um, he was thankful for the faith, hope, and love of these believers, and he wanted to see them continue to exhibit and exercise such virtues. And I hope that we feel the same way. Um, sometimes I've been on, on social media and I've seen somebody that's a non-believer that's actually really kind of atheistic in their position, and they're doing everything they can to tear down Christianity. And I've even made some comments and had some dialogue with some of these people. Because, because you know, I mean, my heart goes out to them. I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel convicted. So, but what I found I could do, because uh, most of them just, they're so set in their way, they won't, they don't, you can't really have a conversation. One lady said she felt sorry for me. That, 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 that I talked about this where she said, Sal salvation, you shouldn't have to work so hard for your salvation. I said, I said, I, I don't, it's free. She said, well, I really feel sorry for you. And I said, don't, I, I'm blessed. I have a great life. I love my life. Please don't feel sorry for me. But um, that just, that was kind of the, the thought that led me to this thing is I felt compelled to pray for her because I feel, I don't know her, but God does. And God can make a change in her life. So I would love nothing more. I will. Ne I may never know until the day I get into heaven, and 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 you know, set in the presence of my Lord. He may say, "Oh yeah, I answered that one." She she'll be here soon, you know. It, it's one, huh? Then you'll see the faces, the song, the faces. You just may never know, but you know, we can pray for people, and God can make a change. And we may not be around to see it, but you know. We did, we did pray and, and, and hopefully with that desire to, to bring about the effect of what we're praying for. How can you not love this picture? <laughs> this picture is adorable. We're talking about prayer. Um, I, I saw this and I, oh, that's got to go in. <laughs> that's got to go in. Uh, I, I love the, she, I love the little intensity she's got going on, you know, to just, uh, that just touches my heart. But anyway, to pray unceasingly is to pray frequently and often about a matter. And so we, we hopefully set up times and, and we pray. And then when we do pray, we pray for those things that we continually want to see brought about. I don't, I pray for the success of this church. I pray for the success of the messages that go out online. I pray that they will affect change in people's lives and that somebody will benefit from them and that God will often see, um, results or use the messages or the lessons to bring about changes and, and that are beneficial to the hearer. Uh, I, you know, and, and I know you guys do too. And I know there's a lot of things that I hear you guys talking about that you pray about. And these things that when we're bringing them consistently in, we're showing God that this is important to us and that we want to continue to, uh, to see this thing come about. Now, since they were constantly on his heart, he prayed for them each uh, at each of his occasions of prayer. And so there's a consistency. There's a pattern when it comes to praying unceasingly. We want to be consistent. It should be something that we are praying about. And I've had, there's things I prayed about that didn't necessarily turn out the way that I prayed. Um, uh, but you know what? They turned out the way that God desired it, what his will was. Because at the end, I said, nevertheless, your will be done. Even though I know what I would like to see, you understand the big picture, and that is more important, you know. And so, I I hope, but I also I also trust God that He knows what's best for the situation. So now we're going to talk about the knowledge of His will, verse nine. Um, one of Paul's prayers was that they would be filled with the knowledge of His will or God's will. Verse 9 said, For this cause we also sense the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the knowledge of his will. Honestly, among the greatest reasons for praying to God is to learn or to be able to discern God's will. Have you ever, have you ever said, God, if you could just tell me what you want me to do. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you you just didn't know, and you're you're just saying, God, can you just can you just one time just voice it to me? 
Like, I just wanted him one time just to say, look, Scott, go, look, it's real simple. Go here, do this, say that, you know, and when you're done with that, do this, 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 and this, cycle around, and then I'll have you set up with three, three or four other things. Just this way. Just do this. Just this way. Don't do it your way. No, do it just this way. I feel like if I could just get that. But in reality, God is speaking to us. He's revealed himself. He is the self-existing one who reveals himself. And I think he loves to reveal himself. I pray for him to reveal himself in, in the ways that he will choose to do it. Um, he might reveal himself in the minute you're, you're forced with a decision that you don't know, but it might become very clear to you what you need to do in that moment. It, he could reveal himself in a lot of different ways with regards to choices in life or um, big moves. Uh, I, we pray about all that stuff and God will reveal himself. He may, he, it's funny because you, when you're praying about it, all of a sudden you get in here and you get the pastor's little handout for the message and you look at the topic and you think, okay, <laughs> I got my, I know, I know this is for me today. This, this is an answer that's coming my way. So I'm <laughs> very alert to God responding to my request for knowledge about certain things through the very messages or devotionals that our fellow members put together. Um, <laughs> which is why I got this picture. Like it, let's, it, it's funny to me because you can plug into the Bible and just get some answers right there. We want that. We want to discern God's will and we pray about it. Well, we got to plug into the Bible. Now we got these smartphones and we can go download the Bible app and we can go to the chapter we want and we can even push the button that says play and it will just read the chapter for us. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I like that. You know, as my son used to say, me like that. That's tool. <laughs> oh, okay. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Got to have a little fun sometimes. All right. Prayer is not so much an attempt to get God to hear our voice, but an attempt to hear his voice, you know, have him reveal <coughs> his will or desire for our life. Cause he knows our every thought. Think about that. He knows everything about us all at once, always, but we glorify God and honor him. When we seek his will, when we're asking for help, you know, when we're saying we don't know what to do, or, um, I really messed this up. That seems to be one of my favorites. <laughs> I really messed this up. Help me, please. Help me figure it out. Help me get back to good. Help me get back to good where I'm not struggling with this or that. Um, and, and, and to do that, I got to know what he wants. And so when I mentioned last week about that passage in Galatians, the, um, the, the virtues of, of the saint, you know, uh, those things that are considered good and against such, there is no law, it said, you know, um, and I said before that, I said, if you, if you're really having issues in life, this is one of those passages of scriptures that if you read, cause it talks about crucifying the lust of the flesh or putting it aside or the, the things that we struggle with or temptation thing. And, and it's really a good passage of scripture to anchor, but you know what? There's not, that's not the only one. There's so many like that, that when we we're trying to figure out how to go or what to do, God already knows he's already answered the question. We just got to plug into it and, and learn. And, and, and the more we can build upon the foundation of our knowledge in the scriptures, the, the better we're going to have at finding the solution to the problem and hearing the voice of God in, in, and all these things, we might be dealing with the situation and he'll just put, pop a verse in our head. You know, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You know, and so we'll face death more comfortably because God's grace is sufficient. You know what I mean? So we don't, it's not terror anymore because God's grace is sufficient. These are the things that I'm just trying to bring to light when it comes to the value of prayer. As such, Christians pray that they will discover and do the will of God. Associated with such knowledge of his will, so understanding the knowledge of his will, are all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So let's take a closer look at these. 
knowledge, um, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. So to do that, I've enlisted the word studies. Word studies is beneficial to help us understand biblical words in greater context. So knowledge is more than just knowing something. Paul wanted the Colossians to have an exact, precise knowledge. And that's really what he was describing there when he was talking about the knowledge of the will of God. Because, see, it's, the word's being elevated by the fact that it's tied to the knowledge of God. All right? So he's looking for something very precise and very exact in the form of knowledge. This is more than just a common knowledge, but also it is used of the divine knowledge that comes with spiritual maturity in the life of the person. So it's more than common knowledge. It's, 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 it's godly knowledge that's been input into us by the word, by the spirit, so that it becomes something that grows us spiritually, which is going to change what we do outwardly. It's going to affect the, our flesh, our fleshly nature. Why? Because it's going to start to constrain it. So as we grow mature in the spirit, that part of us as a saved child of God that's been sealed and kept into the a day of redemption, according to Ephesians 4.30, and now is indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, the earnest of our inheritance, these things are in the scriptures that has been told to us, that as that matures and grows, it begins to um, have an impact on fleshly nature, the way we would do things, the things that we would do and the way we'd go about. It. And I'm not saying by that perfection, because this flesh right here, it's going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. This is, this is going. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I'm, 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 I'm wondering what it would be like to not have a sin thought. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering, do you ever wonder that? Just like, if I could actually walk around for a full day and not have a single sin thought or desire, what that would be like. So, yeah, I, I, that would be a good day. <laughs> but divine knowledge that comes with spiritual maturity in the life of the person. Then there's wisdom. Wisdom is knowing, or <laughs> wisdom is knowledge put to work. Wisdom is the acuteness of mind and heart to use knowledge correctly. It is the management of information for the benefit of others and the upholding of what is good and right towards God and towards others. So wisdom, you know, it's, it's, it's acuteness of mind and heart to use knowledge correctly for the benefit of others, for the benefit of glorifying God. Um, and so up upholding what is good and what is right. And so a wise person will learn how to use the knowledge of things to, and apply it to a way that brings about a good end or a right end. That's wisdom. We go, I, I go to some of those old timers. At, well, I'm one now, I guess. I, I'm wondering when, what age do you get your, your senior discount? I, <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting out of my calendar, man. When do I get that guy? But I, I still got some seniors running around and, and, you know, you go to them sometimes just to, just to, just to get that, that experiential knowledge that they have and just pull it in. You know, what did you do in this situation? How, how would you handle a thing? And they just start unfolding it to you. Like if it was like easy for them, ah, oh, ah, oh, you're doing it the wrong way. The young lad, <laughs> You know, here, here, here's, here's what you got to do. And that's funny because now my kids come to me and they're like, dad, dad, I mean, what do you do? And I'm, I give them the wisdom that I've attained up to this point and, and so forth and so on. So I hope you understand what, what's being applied, what's being referenced here now, an, an acuteness of mind and a heart to use knowledge correctly for right and good towards God, towards others. Spiritual understanding is the realm of the spirit. In the realm of the spirit, there exists a flowing together of knowledge and wisdom that comes from above. And the reason that is true is because we are indwelled as a saved child of God by the Holy Spirit of God. 
So the Holy Spirit is always actively trying to um, move in us in such a way to guide us by his wisdom and his knowledge of godly things, all godliness, all trueness, all rightness. So it's natural. This concept is not some mystical super knowledge, but a running together of these elements in the spirit that allows one to be led and guided by the power of God. Now, these elements are referring to what we've been talking about. Godly knowledge, godly wisdom, godly spiritual understanding. And so God is working to bring together these things through our spirit where that's where that's where we feel the conviction you know when there's a wrong thing and you know it's a wrong thing you feel this conviction in your heart inside your spirit you know that that tells you it's a wrong thing and that's really the knowledge wisdom and spiritual understanding and so paul was praying for these things to flourish and grow in the lives of these individuals as we mentioned just a moment ago Associated with such knowledge of his will are, are um, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Such wisdom, then, is the ability to discern between true and false, not through superior intelligence, but through guidance of the Holy Spirit and really the Word of God. And so it's important that we understand that if we're going to grow, in knowledge and wisdom. And that is a thing to pray for. And I will caution you. I won't caution you. Pray for it. <laughs> because God's going to give you something to do when you do. You understand that, right? When you pray for knowledge and wisdom, how do you think you get it? Do you think you got to study to teach a lesson? <laughs> you got to study to to witness to somebody. You got to know the word. You, so if you're going to ask God for knowledge and wisdom, he's going to give you a job. <laughs> and that's how you're going to get it. You're going to cut your teeth on getting into the word and, and finding out what it says, and then you'll gain it that way. Um, but you, but when you have this knowledge and wisdom working in life, you know, you're know you going to experience fewer difficulties with regards to some of the stumbling blocks others face. There are at least two essential guides, guidelines regarding the will of God. So there's two, at least two things that are guidelines regarding the will of God. These, In other words, these are no-brainers. They are a constant. You, you, if you want to know the will of God, these two things are automatic. Okay, here's the first one. First, he wants all to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the will of God. He wants all to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. First Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So there it is. There's one of the wills of God. The second is he wants all believers to recognize that they have been sanctified or set apart to live for him. And here's another passage of scripture. First Thessalonians four, three through four. It says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So in other words, which is the will of God? that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. For this is the will of God, you see? So he wants us to know that and, and recognize that we've been sanctified. With the word sanctified mean, it's translated from a Greek word that means set apart. And, and some people take that word, Christians sometimes take that word a little bit out of context. And so what they do is they set themselves so far apart, they fail to do the first thing <laughs> that they should be doing. And that is leading people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. How can we, Jesus says, we are in the world, but not of the world. Set apart is talking about um, for his purpose. Some people, get, they get where like they're, they're trying to set themselves so far apart from everything that they perceive to be sinful that they become completely ineffective. And the reality is they've never accomplished it because they're still sinful, <laughs> you know? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a false precept. The reality is we're set apart for the service of God, and that service of God brings us to love others, 
to the closeness of those in need. Jesus said, I, I, you know, when he was in, during his person ministry, he was seeking those who were sick, not those who were well, because he was a great physician. He was looking for the people that needed help. And, and it, it, it sometimes it frustrated his disciples. They didn't know what to do with him sometimes because they didn't understand it, you know? But what he was trying to teach him is, look, if you're well, you don't need a doctor. But if you're sick, you do. So I go to those that are sick so they can be healed. And if we have a sin problem, we're sick. And we need, we need Jesus shed blood to heal us. And so that's what he was trying to teach them. That the sanctification is set apart for the purposes of accomplishing that same work Jesus did during his personal ministry. And to, to, to do that, we're set apart from the standpoint that he wants everyone to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Because this is the, 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 the way he wants his people to represent in the world. <laughs> oh, uh, nah, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm having all these thoughts in my mind, you know? It just makes me think, I, I'm going to be a little funny. How you representing? How y'all representing? Are you representing? <laughs> Don't ask me. I mean, I sometimes, you know what? My oldest daughter laughs at my stuff, all right? She's the only one <laughs> that gets how weird I am. But uh, anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Walk worthy of your calling. I, I, maybe I got too much sleep last night. I don't know. Something's happening. A worthy walk, verse 10. Paul desired that they would walk worthy of the Lord. That was his desire. He wanted them to walk worthy of the Lord. That's how he wanted to represent. Such a walk or conduct is a natural consequence of one's understanding of design will. Do you understand? Walking worthy is a natural consequence of understanding design, divine will. As we understand God's divine will, it will move in us in such a way that it'll bring about changes. And those changes result in us putting aside the things of the flesh and striving more so towards the things of the spirit. The, you know, they say like, like, I don't like to watch stuff that is violent online and i'm you know if there's an accident or some big thing that happened that someone got on video my wife's like oh did did you see that i'm like i don't want to see it I, I you know i don't want to see it. i don't want the image in my mind they say once you see it you can't unsee it but once you hear it you can't unhear it well once you understand the divine divine will you can't unhear it or unknow it and so it rests but see this is the good thing it is a good thing to have rest upon you because it'll produce something divine, something good, something worthy of a walk before the Lord. A, a worthy walk is one that reflects Jesus and a believer's words and deeds. It means to, we circumvent those things around us in a manner that brings value to what we do. So we could do this, but we go around that to do this because this brings value to what we do. And so that's what a worthy walk is. We understand that it requires sacrifice. We understand that it requires um, better choices, informed decisions, knowledge, and wisdom to make the right decision to circumvent those things that were problematic so that we might produce something which is of greater value. I put this picture up because it's uh, cherry season in the Central Valley. And I drive by them on my way home from church and I look at the fields and they're full. And then some of these trees are just like just loaded. And I love the way that they look and the way the farmer takes care of their little cherry trees. And um, so we love cherries in the valley. They're great. But we're going to get to why this picture's up here in just a minute. I'm going to finish these other thoughts first. We walk worthy by doing those things God asks us to do in a manner he tells us and in a suitable way. Basically, we strive to live a godly life. That's walking worthy, striving to live a godly life. 
Prayer is a big factor in being able to accomplish this. I mean, it has to be a part of our, our effort. Studying and learning the truth of the word is another. So through prayer and studying and learning the word of truth is another. Now, why I have the cherry tree picture up is because we're going to talk about faithful and good works. Now, an example of this, in the vegetable realm, fruitfulness is evidence of healthy plants. Have you ever had a, a tomato plant that didn't produce? It would go to bud, and just as it bud, it would just dry up and fall off. And I had to have someone teach me why that was happening. The, health, the plant wasn't healthy. I, I was overwatering it, I think, is what I remember them telling me. And so it was killing off the buds. It wasn't healthy. It was something going on with it. Sometimes um, plants might get, you know, a, a fungus or something like that, and it'll affect the productivity. And so you ever look at a tree and, and see, like I've seen some um, almond trees too, where I'm driving down the road and I can see that the tree is, is too old because it's now it's starting to have all the branches above that have no leaves on them and no fruit on them at all. And the fruit that is on the lower part of the branches is, is minimal. So you're starting to see that the tree is not healthy and that it's, it's, it's old and it's not productive. Okay. Well, and so it is with Christians, spiritually speaking, you know, you can see there's, there's a possibility or a way, you know, that we might fall into this situation where, or patterns of life that we're not fruitful. Fruitfulness implies a need for cultivation. Okay. They don't just plant the tree. Now, okay. I could give you a whole story on how they do almonds. I watch them. They'll pull them out of the ground. The older trees, after like 13 years, they'll pull them out of the ground. They'll cut them up or they'll shred them up. They'll, they'll turn the soil, get that all, get roots all out. They'll let it set for a little bit. Then they'll come back and they'll put, they'll get a, a, a digger out there and they'll dig these holes, backhoe, and they'll dig all these holes where the new trees are going to go five or six feet down. The dirt will set there for a while. Then they'll push it back in. Then they'll go back over it again. Then they'll lay out all the trees again, right over where those holes were, but then now they're all flat again. Then they'll plant the trees in that soil because that soil is going to be soft. It's going to take root fast and it's going to grow faster as a result. And they're going to fertilize and they're going to water and they're going to cultivate. So it, it, fruitfulness implies the need for cultivation. You don't just throw it in the ground and leave it. You got to water it. The farmer or gardener must give proper attention to the pruning, watering, feeding, and so forth. When we used to do almonds as kids, we go uh, every year after the harvest, we'd go in and we would cut off the, what they call the sucker wood. It was the first branches up, the, the first year wood, because they said it wasn't productive. And so we'd go and we'd prune all that off so that it wouldn't steal energy from the tree in its effort to produce more fruit. So it was pruned. God does the same for his saints, okay? In John 15, verses one through five, Jesus gave two conditions for the most effective fruit bearing, okay? First, the branch must be vitally connected to the trunk. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you're not connected to me, you will not produce. So, for us to be productive, we have to be connected to the life force, the vine, the one who feeds us through his energy, through his strength, through his power, the one who, who uh, gives us the nutrients and passes that on to us from the vine. So as branches we're receiving, as that vine goes down into the ground and it's pulling those nutrients from the soil and distributing it through the plants, uh, branches and stuff, and the fruits that are being produced, Jesus is that is the example of that for us, the main vine that we're, we're to be connected to. So you have to be connected. Second, the branch must be pruned of non-productive offshoots. So there, there, it needs to be cultivated. So in the branch, uh, in the vine, we're going to get the nutrients, we're going to get the nutrition, we're going to get the water, we're going to get the stuff that we would get from the main life force of the, the, the tree, or in this case, the vessel, um, him being our life force. And then he's going to prune those things that are not productive from our life. Okay. So God's going to start to mold or sanctify or prune our lives to become what he wants us to be. Paul reminded the Colossian saints that they should be fruitful in every good work. 
And I put back here, reference Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and it's in this PowerPoint, but you can also go look it up. And I'd say, read, read all that. Just read the whole chapter. <laughs> if you're going to read something in a chapter, just read the whole chapter. Just have fun with it, you know? Um, that way you get more context and you read more stuff and, and it helps with your reading time. So increasing in the knowledge of God, verse 10. This expression does not refer to one's knowledge about God, but to knowledge which God gives a believer, okay? It's the knowledge that God gives, increasing in the knowledge of God, that he's providing, that he's downloading, that he's revealing. Every time we set through a lesson, every time we study the word, God is revealing something to us. And if we're listening, we will get it. And the Holy Spirit is moving to bring it to our understanding, and, and, and remind us of other things that we've studied as well. Proper conduct must be based on proper knowledge. Now, <laughs> I know it's coming next, and, and this is it. <laughs> this is a Bible that gets used, all right? <laughs> this person, whoever this person's Bible is, they that's I like that. I mean, hey, use your notes. Put it in there. Make notes to yourself. So when you come back to that verse, you, you remember what you learned when you're studying and have it there. And if you're ever witnessing to something, boy, someone you're going to have, you're going to have all kinds of stuff right there at your fingertips, you know? So, um, don't be afraid to, to write in your Bible and, and make notes because that helps you to remember or highlight things that you want, uh, to, to reread and, and have, have it impact your life. For Christians to produce the right kind of fruit, they must know what is good, appropriate, and acceptable in the eyes of God. Okay? They got to know. The knowledge of what God imparts through his word and his spirit to believers enables them to know what he wants them to do. That is the key. This is, it's, we've, been, we've been repeating this theme, this whole lesson, and it's coming. It just seems to be pressing constantly, constantly, constantly through all phases of what is being taught here. And, and that is the knowledge which God imparts through his word and his spirit to believers enables them to know what he wants them to do. And through prayer, he will continue to answer and provide those things we stand in need of. He's the great vine and we're the branches. This is also linked to understanding the will of God. So all of this is linked to understanding the will of God, which I think we just pointed out. What God has revealed about himself and his purposes is set forth in his word. Okay, as we start to wind down, we get to verse 11. And verse 11 says, strengthened according to his glorious power. Is that possible? Absolutely. We can be strengthened according to his glorious power. If these Colossian believers were to accomplish all the things that Paul had instructed up to this point, then he knew they would need to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And so this, this was a good prayer. And, and this is a prayer that we, again, if you want to know what to pray for, for yourself or for others, pray for these things. There are good things to pray for. The Greek word for strengthened is from the Greek word dunamis. And it refers to force or ability, but not just force or ability. It means might and miraculous power. So when you think about strengthened, we're talking about strengthened by God's force and ability, by his might and by his miraculous power. The ability or strength of the Colossian saints to exert the force necessary to do what God wanted them to do was based on the power he provided them through himself. So if we're going to accomplish anything work-wise for the Lord, we need his, his dunamis, his power, his, for, his force, his ability. And it's one of the greatest things to ever experience when God is empowering you to accomplish a work that he has set your feet to. I would go as far as to say it's kind of an addictive thing, you know, to be able to... to Feel the Holy Spirit of God well up and just take over a situation. This word dunamis is a dynamic power of God that propels believers 
to fulfill the will of God. Here's something interesting. The Greek word dunamis is from, is the word from which we get our word dynamite. So when you, you want to put it into perspective, think about a dynamite and, and a blast where they'll take it and they'll, they'll drill holes in a mountain. They'll push the dynamite in, they'll run it off. Or I've seen uh, where videos where they've taken it and, and staged a whole building with dynamite. And when they set it off, that building just fell right down to the ground, just crumbled. That's what we're talking about, but on a godly level. And so it, it, that word helps us to see the force, the might, the power that we're tapping into. And finally, patient, long-suffering, and joyful. God empowers believers so they can exercise patience and a long-suffering spirit and a joyfulness. Now, these are challenging, all three of them. All right, because <laughs> patience is is a virtue that comes by being tried. <laughs> so you're you're only going to learn patience if you're tried. Otherwise, you don't have to be patient because you're not really being tried. And if you're being tried, you're going to have to learn long suffering. And to do to be tried and be and struggle to be patient and long suffering, but yet be joyful in the midst of it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, now we're getting to the meat of the matter here. So patience is from the Greek word, which literally means remaining under. It denotes fortitude or endurance. See, it's, it's, it's a choice. It's, it's patience is a choice. The person is remaining under that trial. They're enduring it, and they're, they're being patient in it. Um, I think it helps if we put it in God's hands. Patience becomes an easier thing when we lay, when we give control of it to God. Um, we can't control every outcome, but God's sovereign. He can, no matter what yes or no thing we do or choice we make, God can still bring about his will. That's what sovereign means. He can make his will happen in light of the decisions of a billion people <laughs> at the same time. And that's a, that's a big thought. So patience is from the Greek word, which literally means to remain under willfully. It's, it's a choice, fortitude and endurance. Okay. It is the ability to withstand opposition, hardship, persecution, temptation, and deprivation. Patience. See this, this, this one convicted me to this, this week. Um, Cause I, when you get into the definition and you think of it, it's the ability to withstand opposition, hardship, persecution, temptation, and deprivation. And sometimes I'm just not patient enough to do that. But that's, that would be a good thing for me to pray for, for myself, that my patience might. <laughs> my dad used to say, don't pray for patience. <laughs> You're going to have hardship, boy. But he was joking around. Of course, he wanted me to learn. Long suffering is the ability that enables one, it shouldn't say on, <laughs> enables one to endure opposition or hardship without retaliating. <laughs> oh. Why do they put horns on cars? <laughs> I don't need a horn in my car. No, I'm kidding. But uh, for safety reasons, for sure. But, you know, they oftentimes get used for a lot of other things. Um, but <laughs> the ability to endure opposition or hardship without retaliating, long suffering. Think about how long suffering God is with us. My goodness. How long suffering is he is with us? And for the years. <laughs> wow. He's the prime example. The, 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 the benchmark for long suffering. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels, but he was patient. He endured. He, he remained under and he was long suffering. It will allow the believer to deal with adverse circumstances without becoming bitter or cynical. Long suffering will teach you a virtue that will help you to deal with adverse circumstances without becoming bitter or cynical. Part of that, I think, is just understanding the situation. 
when you when you see things more clearly through growth in the scripture, it's a little bit easier to become longstanding because you can understand. Y- yeah, sometimes some of those people that I've talked to online, they 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 can frustrate you. But in the end, you know, I understand their end. And 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 I can be long suffering because I would rather see them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so it's easier because I understand the end of the thing if the, if the situation don't change for them. So that's what I'm saying. We become knowledge, we get all this godly knowledge and understanding and wisdom, then we become more long suffering because we understand the bigger picture as God sees it. Through joyfulness, the believer can exercise true patience and long suffering. <laughs> so now here's the key to in enduring patience or being patient and enduring long a long suffering situation. Because we have the joy of God in our heart. You know, if we allow his love and his joy to flourish within us, then we can be more patient. We can be more because they will produce that in us. Joyfulness will produce a patient spirit and a long suffering one. And finally, we'll close with this. Joyfulness will prevent a woe is me or a why me Lord attitude. Those two are very destructive to the work of the Lord, to the life of the individual. Woe is me. Why me, Lord? Why did this happen? I've seen so many people who they, they, they blamed God for something that happened in their life because it was destructive to them. And the thing that happened was destructive to them. And they felt like that it shouldn't have been something they had to experience. Maybe a loss of a child, maybe a loss of a spouse. But the reality is God knows the end of the thing. He knows what we don't. He ultimately makes the decision. He is the sovereign God. And oftentimes hindsight is 2020. You get five years down the road, you might see things differently. You might see them a month down the road. But nevertheless, God knows what's best and his will be done. And that should be the right attitude of the child of God. We want the will of God in our lives, but it doesn't mean that we're not going to endure difficulties in life. This is a sin sick world. You know, we deal with and struggle with sin our whole life and we will, we will be tried. And sometimes we're tried just for the fact that, you know, wh- where are we at in our faith? You know, how are you going to know if your faith and your hope and your love, your pillars are strong enough to support the structure if you don't experience difficulties? How can God see the value of the faith and the life of the individual? And how can you express it to others if we're never tried? Yeah, I've lost a father. I've lost my mother, my father-in-law grandparents. I was there when my grandmother, my mom, and my dad took their last breath. And it was hard. Did I want them to go? No. But God, it was God's time, his choice, his hour. And I got in the midst of it to see God moving with them in dealing with bringing them home. In other words, I saw things that I rejoiced in why my mom passed, why my dad passed, or why my grandma passed, because I was there to witness it. And so half cup half full, cup, cup half empty. What, why me, Lord? What was me? What place have those in the life of the child of God? All right, we're going to close now. Thank you so much for making it this far with me in this first PowerPoint of chapter one. And then we will go and we'll start next week, by the way, uh, I will be out of town. Brother Greener will be filling in for me. Um, But then we'll come back and we'll, Lord willing, if he gives a day, we'll get into the the next parts of this chapter, which are going to start to get warm and it's going to be a lot of fun. So hopefully you join us for that. I'm going to close this now in a word of prayer. Gracious Holy Father, we come before you, Lord, with thankful hearts for this day that you've made. Once again, we give you praise for the truth of your word. 
And Lord, I know the deeper we go into it, the more time we spend just looking at these things, the more that you reveal. And, and there, it seems to be just an endless fountain of truth and, and revelation for our benefit. And, and the more time I know that we spend in this, the more we're going to benefit, the more it's going to affect our lives. And it's going to bring about the result I believe you intend. And that's to anchor us, to, to anchor us on the foundation of Jesus so that we won't be shaken with the changes and difficulties of this life. Lord, that when trials come, we'll be anchored to that foundation and we'll turn to you and rely on you for the strength and endurance we need to be patient and long-suffering with the situation, that the knowledge and wisdom that you provide, that you give, and the, the ability to pray and come before you will be the secrets to our success. Father, we know that these things you've provided, you've done, and you've given us so that we might be benefited, that we might grow, and that we might flourish because you love us, because you care, and you've shown us that in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, help us to remember these things. Help us to apply them to our life each day that you give, each breath that you give. Help us to praise you, to honor and glorify you in all things. Please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. Please give us a loving heart towards others. Help us to be a light in the world so that others might see the love of God in us. And Father, I ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' holy name and for his sake and praise. Amen. Thank you. I woke up to the summer shining through Calling out my friends asking what's the move Feeling a little different, I'm on something new Today, today I ain't gonna let no clouds get in my way The only road I'm walking is the one I pick Catch me sitting in the sun, no top of shade Today, today Ooh. This is the day that the Lord has made Ooh. 